it's Friday. We made it through the week, folks. Somehow we made it through the week. Um, we're here reading Queer Magic by Thomas Prower. It's a wonderful book about spirituality from around the whole world. If you were waiting for me yesterday and I never showed up, I had a lot of adult chores yesterday that just took all of my time and attention, like unemployment governmental things, which are not fun. Um, yeah, by the time I got home, I was so tired I needed to go to bed. So here we are now. We're learning about Christianity, chapter 10, page 123, if anyone is following along with me at home. And before we get into it, I do want to bring us all into just like a collective intentional moment. Let's just take a deep, big deep breath together and let it out. And once more, with greater intention to come together. And out. Okay, now that we're all here together. What about Christianity? Um, the cultural perspective is the first part of the chapter, as always. So let's begin. There's a lot of LGBT plus mysticism in the Christian faith. It's important, though, to be very specific when we talk about the dominant faith of the Western world since Roman times. When someone says Christianity, what do they mean? Christianity itself is highly fragmented into numerous denominations that run the gamut from highly conservative Southern Baptists to highly liberal Unitarians. Roughly, however, the three main branches that make up the vast majority of the world's Christians are in descending order of a number of adherents. Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox. Technically, Catholicism and Ether, Ether, Eastern Orthodoxy are pretty similar to each other, except for a very small number of uh, ir irreconcilable you mm, okay. Um, sounds like you can't, they don't, they don't work together, right? Differences. Protestantism is a generic name that encompasses almost every other subdivision of the faith that is not directly Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. As we'll explore later, there are quite a number of queer saints, mystics, theologians, and spiritual leaders who transcended traditional gender roles and heteronormativity. Heteronormativity. That's a big word, folks. It's a big word for Elmo. <laughs> but for the queer culture of Christianity, the best place in history is... Uh, history to look is in the early church era where there were no schisms or various denominations back when all Christians were united as one. The political climate of the time played a large part on why the early Christians were so tolerant. You see, they were still a small, obscure religion that had stigmatization of looking like cannibals due to the Eucharist ceremonies. In the eyes of the pagan majority, and they were also being actively persecuted, partly for the political scapegoating reasons and partly because they were rebellious upstairs, upstarts, challenging the majority status quo. So the early Christians needed all the help they could get, and they didn't ask too much about new converts since they needed the numbers and support. As long as the newcomers accepted the teachings of Jesus Christ, all was well. In these regional early church groups, the Gnostics were particularly accepting of queer ideology, labeled a heretical group by the Jews and Christ most Christians of the time. Gnosticism was a radically anti-authority group that wasn't keen on the idea of God being an authoritarian who demanded unquestioning obedience and worship from humans. They would be akin to the people you see nowadays with question everything bumper stickers on their cars. They believed that God was more like a divine teacher, and that salvation was ultimately dependent upon the individual to awaken to his or her inner divinity. In fact, they got their name from the Greek word gnostis, meaning knowledge. And in particular, that scene in the Garden of Eden when the snake hands the apple of knowledge to Eve, making her aware of her own self and her own potential. To the Gnostics, 
The snake was the good guy hero of the story. Knowledge is power, and blind faith is voluntary slavery. Wow, that is an opinion, folks. It's a good one, though. Again, I don't really know where I lie anymore. If you're following me on TikTok, you kind of know that I'm having like a queer faith existential crisis right now. <laughs> ah, but if you're not and you find this for years in the future, good luck trying to find it. I'm sure TikTok will bury it. When it came to sex, they were all for it, especially non-procreative -pro sex. This is the Gnosticics, by the way. In a roundabout way, oral, anal, and homosexual acts, along with masturbation and hand jobs, were seen as morally superior by the Gnostics, specifically the Cathars and Bogomils Gnostics, because procreative sex just ended up making another human for this world for the authoritative establishment to rule over. Mm, man, I I, I wish that genuinely, if, if mm, I just know that there's so much powerful information in here that if the actual the masses could actually have access to it, it would be revolutionary. We would rise up and change the world. We would realize that 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 we have the power within us to change the world to create the world that we want. Unfortunately, this book is trapped inside this. We, these words are trapped inside this book, and even though I'm trying to get these words out into you, they're just trapped inside this little tiny bubble. So if you see this and you think queer sexuality and queer spirituality is cool and interesting, please invite one of your friends to hang out with us and also learn about it because only together with numbers can we rise up and claim our power back and take back our world. It is from the Bulgarian Bogo Mills that the British slang word bugger, meaning sodomy, originated. Furthermore, as Gnostic salvation was internal, even if you had kids, you couldn't teach them salvation. It's up to them to save themselves in such hard times. As for Jesus himself, well, he never mentioned anything about homosexuality or gender-based sins. He, we don't have any recordings of what he mentioned, and I would firmly believe that's because he said that there was no sin, that there was nothing wrong, that, you know, that, 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 um, consensual power dynamic, intimate power dynamics between two consenting adults is way better than pedophilia, which is what Jesus was undoing. You know, I firmly believe that a lot of the Bible has not been added to the Bible. A lot of the original text has purposely been lost and taken out. Um, soonish and i mean sometime in the next 12 months um i'm planning on having a whole series on my lovejoy love be good read channel all about the mistranslations in the bible and how homosexuality isn't a sin and it's part of god's glorious creation so that'll be up at some point in the future you know but i'm doing all this by myself so we got it <laughs> but anyway i'm really excited to be talking about that it's one of the things that um Hurt, that hurts me the most about life. So I'm trying to change it. Where the New Testament of the Bible turns horribly homophobic is in the Acts of the Apostles. This is because of Paul. Because Paul never met Jesus, yet 40% of the New Testament is Paul's works. Is in the Acts of the Apostles. A sort of, where are they now? sequel to the Gospels. This is because the game-changing character of the game this is because of the game-changing character now known as Saint Paul. While not technically a homophobe by today's standards, Saint Paul was just terribly prudish and ultra zealous, probably asexual, probably sex averse. You know, we need all of us, but I don't know how he got such a big voice. Converting to Christianity later in his life, St. Paul felt he had to make up for lost time and made it his business to save the world's souls by spreading the good news. He was a unique among early Christians in that he was a legal Roman citizen, a former Jew, and highly educated, all of which made him the perfect missionary to bridge cultural gaps and freely travel the Roman Empire. His condemnations of everything sexual, especially the promiscuity that Greek and Roman men had with other men outside of marriage, were very influential and became the bedrock 
from which from where the church would build its anti-queer foundations. Nevertheless, St. Paul was just one albeit influential man, and the early church was still not an organized religion and still on shaky ground, and thus fairly tolerant. The most commonly pointed to example of this are the same-sex weddings being granted to lesbians and gays during the era, most famously starting with the relationship between St. Sergius and St. Bacchus. According to history, these two were officials in the Roman army and obviously very close. They served under the reign of Emperor Maximin, who was extremely anti-Christian, and when was discovered and when it was discovered that they were Christians, they were arrested, publicly humiliated, sent to trial and tortured. St. Sergius survived the torture, but St. Bacchus was beaten so severely that he died of his injuries. As legend goes, his ghost appeared to his lover, encouraging him to stay strong, for they would be reunited again in heaven. These words were prophecy, as St. Sergius was soon sentenced to be beheaded. For years following their martyrdom, these two saints were recognized by church leaders and writers as having a romantic relationship. Getting into specific, St. Sergius was known as the sweet and gentle bottom, while St. Boxus was was the more rough and aggressive top. The relationship was officially documented in the oldest text of church martyrdom. Following their lead, Christian groups all over the Roman Empire began granting wedding unions to same-sex couples, both men and women, ranging from the 8th to 18th centuries, records of which have been found in places such as Vatican City, Paris, St. Petersburg, Istanbul, Ireland, and the Sinai Peninsula. Of course, both the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches deny this, claiming that these records, including that of St. Sergius and St. Bacchus, were not of weddings, but just a form of recognition for two same-sex people who were very close. (laughs) Who were very close friends, known as brother-making ceremonies. (laughs) Which is like the modern day explanation equivalent of when you tell your parents that the two that the two middle aged men across the street who have been living together for years on end are just friends. Like, I really hope that there's someone out there in the future who is listening to this and is just like really blown away by how much queer history there is in our ancestors' lives and how much of it has just been completely stripped from what we've been told is our history, from our society. And and we can just get the word out there. Slowly with time, we can just get the word out there and, and, and create the world we all know is possible to live in. Even if there are five people or 500 people who are stopping us from obtaining that right now. The fall of the Western Roman Empire marked the definitive turning point in Christian LGBT plus relations. The Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantine Empire, became a severe theocracy and clamped down on queerness. While the remnants of the rest of the empire began dissolving into the dark ages marked by superstition, isolating feudalism, and a fear towards all those who were different, during this time, all minorities were targeted as scapegoats in particular gays, lesbians, and non-Christians. It was also when St. Thomas Aquinas popularized homosexuality as evil, sinful, and against the natural law of things, since it couldn't result in procreation, the only church-sanctioned reason for sexual activity. That's a bummer. It's definitely like the worst reason to have sex. It eventually came to the point where sodomy was a crime punishable by death, most infamously in the trials of the Knights Templar. For Christianity's lesbians, things were a bit different. Christianity had a strange time categorizing female-female love. Naturally, in accordance with St. Thomas Aquinas' natural law, classifications of sexual acts. Hinky-pinky between two women was unnatural since it couldn't result in the blessings of pregnancy. As the Christian-dominated Middle Ages marched onward, though, the legal descriptions of sex began to all revolve around the penetrative power of a man's penis. This meant homosexuality was legally, legally punishable by two men, but not 
between two women, which also is why I thought it was okay for me to like women when I was 17 years old, because I wasn't a man liking a man, because they just give us really confusing information, and if they just didn't give us confusing information to begin with in the first point, we would be okay. Hmm. By around the 13th century, however, the powers that be eventually categorized female-female eroticism as equals to sodomy, punishable by mutilation and death. Nevertheless, there did exist a safe haven for many Christian lesbians, the nunnery. By becoming a nun and moving into an all-female convent, Homosexual women were given a solid alibi by which to avoid marriage and sex with men altogether. And whatever happened behind the cloister walls was their business. While a number of lesbian nuns have been identified, arguably none were as influential and politically open, poetically, poetically open about their sexuality as Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz. But more on her in the upcoming deities and legends section. Beyond same-sex female attraction, though, the church was passing judgment as to what they regarded as an anomaly in God's creation. Intersex individuals. Officially, St. Augustine addressed the problem of people with both male and female parts in his damning chef de city of God, by letting Christians know that these people were monstrosities. Unofficially, however, Average medieval Christian day-to-day dealings with intersex people was much less hateful. The problem was not so much the physiology of an intersex individual, but the moral choices that individual made. In theory, these people, then known as hermaphrodites, were allowed to choose their own preferred gender. However, if they chose male, then they were barred from having sex with men. And if they chose female, then they were barred from having a penetrative relationship with other women. Still, these things were a bit more complex. I mean, like, but, ugh, I mean, uh, never mind. Never mind. Still, things were a little bit more complex than that in the Catholic cultures, since it was usually the intersex individual's godparents who chose the child's sex at baptism, thus dictating all future expected gender roles and sexual preferences. Technically, I mean, despite, if even if you're not born intersex, technically, like, just by being raised male or female in today's society, like, how you're supposed to act around people is still being chosen and decided for you. I do think that there's circles and movements where people are allowing a little bit of more universal self-expression in their children, but... That's not the universal experience yet. Technically, once the intersex child came of age, they were permitted to choose their own gender. But having been already labeled as a boy or a girl in the local village, it was highly frowned upon for them to choose to be the alternate gender. All in all, although official Christian theology has condemned intersex individuals as monstrosities, so long as they choose a side and stayed within the moral confines of their choice, they were in better better shape than homosexual women and in much better shape than homosexual men of the time. Christian takeaway, self-salvation. The Gnostic Christians emphasize being fully responsible for your own salvation. In magic, this is an ultimate truth because no matter what spell you are doing, at the end of the day, it's between you and your connection to either the natural forces of the universe or the divine. You can read books, you can pay to have people do spells for you, but no long lasting significant manifestation of change will occur if you do not take ownership of your own power. You heard that? You let me read that to you again. No long lasting, significant manifestation of change will occur if you do not take ownership of your own power. We're taking back our power back, folks. In case you haven't got the memo yet, that's what I'm here to do, to help you take your power back. Okay, that was weird. 
But I just think, I, I know, I know that if we can all unravel the individual spool, spools that have been tied up inside of us of what we think about and believe about the world, and if we unwind it, and if we let the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of love and of mercy and of graciousness and of everyone being accepted to come into our hearts and to unspool us and to unravel us, slowly we can all tug at the little threads that make up the tapestry of our society and we can unravel it, and we can figure out where the knots are in those corrupt racist systems that we've created, and cut them out, or untie them, and figure it out, and then we'll have all of these beautiful threads of ourselves spooled up in ourselves, not entangled with other one, and then we can figure out how to recreate and rebuild the tapestry of life and society together. It's not a big thing to ask for. Come on, folks, I'm being totally reasonable here. I think I am. Okay. Thinking we can always rely on others <clears throat> to do our magic for us is lazy and naive. Also, your magic is more powerful when it comes from you. When it's your intention that you are birthing into the universe, it's the most powerful thing. Similarly, it is up to our own queer selves to make life better. While com comforting and uplifting the It Gets Better campaign isn't universally true. It doesn't get better. You get better you get stronger, you get more confident, you get more vocal, you get bigger boundaries, you understand where you begin, where you end and the next person begins. It's not a circumstantial thing, it's a you thing. It's all about transformation. That's what we're doing here, folks. We are transforming ourselves. With age usually comes self-confidence and self-knowledge, which in turn leads to things getting better because we stop caring what other th people think of us and start living our own truth. But if we never take ownership of ourselves, never acknowledge our own truths, and expect everyone else to suddenly become more accepting in order for our lives to get better, it's never going to get better. Just like the queer positive Gnostics understood, it is up to us to save ourselves. It's naive to expect society and others to change for us. Really, once we as a whole take our own happiness into our own hands, society usually follows suit. But it all starts within each of us first. Isn't that what I was just saying? That's what I was just saying. That's what I was just saying, you guys. Come on, it's all inside all of us. So, for your next magical activity, do a unique spell all on your own. Don't copy anything from your own tradition, don't use what you learned in books, and don't rely on outside information. Do a spell based solely on your divine intuition. Pick a general objective for the spell, then go out in the world and collect materials based on your intuition and what calls you. Once you have what you feel you need, Assemble them how you feel they should be assembled, and do whatever you feel is right for the ritual. You can, if need be, seek divine advice in meditation or prayer. But don't rely on outside information for every step along the way. Books and information are meant to be guides, not crutches. Show yourself that you have all the magic and knowledge of the universe inherent within you. Also, I'm going to just take a little Lovejoy pause brief note real fast and just simply state, I firmly believe that magic, the most powerful magic, is from the intention inside of your heart. It's inside of your spirit. It's, it's, it's the reality that you want to bring into the world. That desire is in you. And that desire is in you because you have the potential, you have the possibility to bring that desire into the world. You wouldn't have been gifted with a vision of a more beautiful option if you don't have the power already to create it with inside of you. I firmly believe that. So if you already have this power inside you to create the intention that you desire, if you have that will, you can state it, you can speak it into existence. Our words are power. Our words are so powerful. Anything that we speak, these are spells. We're speaking spells over ourselves, over the world. And so if, if speaking is scary, you can write it down too. You can just write it down. Words are important. You know, you're cementing that intention into your life by writing it down. And if all of that it feels overwhelming, I genuinely believe that you can also bring about manifestation, bring about change by just thinking about it.
by just thinking about how good it will be when you wake up tomorrow morning full of energy and vigor with the ideas that you need to accomplish the things, the tasks that you have set for yourself that day. You don't need fancy rocks and candles and herbs and, and grids and graphs and to make it all perfect for it to all come into being in the perfect way. I think that by doing that, we are just... Um, putting more pressure on ourselves, more fear on ourselves, being like, well, of course the outcome didn't work out because I had my citrine two millimeters to the right of my amethyst as opposed to one millimeter to the right of my amethyst. Like, I don't know. These are just my personal thoughts. I don't, but I firmly believe that everyone has the power has power within them. Everyone has magic and you can create the life for yourself that you want just by speaking it into existence. Okay, that's my soapbox. I'm going to get off of it now, and I'm going to keep reading about deities, because that's what we're all here to do. <clears throat> all right. I also have my water with me. Did you guys get water? Oh, that's so good. Remember, it's important to hydrate. Don't die straight. Water is very, very important. <sighs> deities and legends. Pope Joan. Pope Joan was pontiff at the Catholic Church for about 10 years in the late 9th century. Her officially adopted papal name, however, was John VIII. These were the times when women were barred from getting a good education. So to circumvent this, Joan disguised herself as a boy under the pseudonym John and went to a German monastery where higher education was part and parcel of being a monk. As the years went by, the lie became the truth. Joan preferred to self-identify as a male and fell in love with another monk. The monk's sudden, su the monk's sudden death caused their romance to be short-lived, and the grieving Joan transferred to Rome for a change of scenery. Once in Rome, Joan's advanced intellectualism garnered admiration from prominent cardinals, ultimately leading to Joan's election as Pope John VIII, since no one knew that Joan was not biologically male. Pope John VIII eventually became pregnant by one of the papal attendants. After a few months, Vatican staff members realized their new pope was a biological female. But rather than admit that God and the leaders of the church had made a mistake in electing a transgender person to the papacy, all attempts were made to conceal the truth. Nevertheless, John VIII soon died during childbirth while on a procession in Rome. That is so sad. That is so sad. I wonder if she actually died or if she was alive. Needless to say, the Catholic Church officials denies Pope the John VIII ever being female. But due to the lack of official records from this time and the conflicting um, extant inf informal records, a number of historians assert the validity that Pope Joan and the conspiracy of the Catholic Church's erasure of her, him. I would say that if Pope Joan preferred, and that's like one of my issues with this text, is that Thomas Prower does make a good example of bringing in intersexual and transgendered individuals and saying like, mm, they might have been trans, they prefer to dress as a man, but still uses she, her pronouns for them. I don't understand why Thomas Prower isn't using they, them pronouns or the pronouns that would have related to the gender that they chose to identify as. That is something that's very upsetting to me in this text. Um, so I try to read over it with the pronouns that I think are better, a better fit. Uh, that's just a little, a little thing. Um, <clears throat> okay. Our next legend is Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz, the poetic lesbian from before. Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz was a nun in colonial Mexico right at the end of Catholic Spain's golden age in the 17th century. Sor being Spanish for a religious sister. In her youth, she exhibited great distaste for gender norms, going so far as to claim in one of her poems, I am not a woman. I know only that my body is neither one gender nor the other. I really... Extremely smart and unwilling to be denied higher education due to her biological sex, 
Gender fluid Juana schemed to pull a yentl like ruse on the patriarchy by applying to and attending a religious university disguised as a man. Her mother, however, would not have would have none of that. And so Juana pursued another alternative, being a lady in waiting in the court of Antonio Sebastian de Toledo, Toledo, the viceroy of New Spain, where informal intellectualism would be readily available to her. It didn't take too long for everyone to realize that this new lady in waiting was a savant. In particular, her academic aptitude and physical beauty caught the eye of the viceroy's wife, the vicereen, Lenar Cargareto. Far from jealousy, the viceroy held a great admiration for Juana's talents, so much that he became her financial patron and approved of the growing intimate bond developing, developing between her and his wife. Despite her love for the vicereen, though, Juana's first love was always education, and the only place for women to receive the highest education in New Spain at the time was in the nunneries. And so, forsaking love for education, Juana left courtly life and became a nun. From her convent in Mexico City, Sor Juana became a prolific writer of poetry, books, academic literature, philosophical theses, and letters advocating the rights of women, indigenous people, and African slaves. Unfortunately, her outspokenness got her in trouble with the Catholic establishment. The Archbishop of Mexico condemned her liberalism and gave her the ultimatum of ceasing her advocacy against the status quo or having all of her work censored from human view. Consequently, the church confiscated all of her works, her, li her library of books, and her scientific equipment. Left with nothing but her mind, this gender-fluid pansexual Catholic nun continued with her religious vows until she died of sickness due to administering care to those stricken with the plague. Despite the church's continued censor censorship of Sor Juana's liberal writings and erotic letters, much of her work was saved and available to us nowadays, thanks to her longtime lover, the Viceroy of New Spain. That is truly one of my favorite stories in this whole book. I think it's beautiful. I really do love it. Okay, I think we have, oh, two more, three more. Wow, a lot of deities this time. How are we doing on time? We're at 30 minutes, okay. Oof, you will learn just about a couple more deities. Oh, and then we're gonna go about our day and enjoy our weekend figure out how we're going to claim our power back. <sighs> Take back our country. St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Clairvaux? Clairvaux. St. Bernard is the patron saint of candle makers, beekeepers, and the Knights Templar. He was a 25th century French abbot of the Caesarian order who was known for being very passionate about Catholicism. He was terribly zealous, as evidenced by his prominent role in convincing the Christians of Europe and the Middle East to embark on the First Crusade, the advocacy for which the Knights Templar made him their official patron. He also had a penchant for writing poetry about his love for Jesus Christ that verged heavily on the romantically erotic, often with him metamorphosizing into a woman in order to be able to full in order to fully be able to accept Jesus's special love for him. Wow. Wow. That's intense. That's something I truly never understood is like these people who claim to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ or have fallen in love with Jesus Christ. I never understood that. That doesn't make any sense to me. In many ways, his writings were very much like the infamous Faith Plus One album of the eponymous band fronted by Eric Cartman. Except Bernard's poetry was truly sincere. In fact, the gay subtext of these writings were so well known even back then that passing under the rainbow of Saint Bernard became a French euphemism for undergoing a gender change. I love that. I love that. Passing under the rainbow of Saint Bernard. Mm, I wanna. Okay. Unsurprisingly, though, the church asserts his writings were neither sexual nor queer, just a profoundly affectionate love for our Lord and Savior. Dude, that sounds really sexual and queer. 
like not gonna lie that just sounds really gay <sighs> in catholic veneration his feast day is august 20th what's coming up kind of saint hilde hildegard von bingen Saint Hildegard von Bingen is the patron saint of the environment, medicine, writing, and the religious life. She was a 12th century German abscess of the Bernedictine order, who exhibited genius levels of savvy in everything she did. She wrote plays, invented her own language, and was an accomplished scientist, a respected poetess, a noted artist, and a philosopher of mysticism. She was also sexually interested in other women. With the exception of some of her devotional writings about the Virgin Mary and her medical writings on how a woman's sexual pleasure was not dependent on men, Hildegard's lesbianism was fairly under wraps. That is, until fate intervened and forced her to fight for the woman she loved. Wow! What a story, folks! The woman in question was her personal assistant, Richardus von Stade. The fateful agent was Richardus's brother, who happened to be an archbishop, archbishop. The crux of the problem was that Richardus's brother secured her to be the abscess of her own convent far away, and Hildegard was not having it. Perhaps more than was appropriate for someone in her position, she pleaded for her assistant to stay. But Hildegard was evidently more involved in the relationship than Ricardus, because Ricardus was all in favor of her nepoto nepotistic promotion. So, desperate to force her lover to not abandon her, man, Hildegard has, like, deep attachment issues. She needed to work on that. Hildegard famously petitioned the Pope himself to step in and prevent Ricardus's transfer, which, of course, he didn't and Richardus moved away. In a twist of fate, Richardus unexpectedly died later that year, allegedly with her last words being how she missed Hildegard and wanted to return to her lover. When Hildegard found all this out, she mourned profusely, channeling her sorrow into artistic achievements, since the, such as the world's first morality play, Ordu Virtorum, Order of the Virtues. Wow. Not only the first, probably not the first lesbian play, but like that's definitely something that's very interesting to me. And Catholic veneration, her feast day is September 17th. One last saint, and then we are set free for the weekend, folks. Saint Sebastian. Saint Sebastian is the patron saint of archers, plague victims, soldiers, and a holy Christian death. Unofficially, he is known as the patron saint of gay male love and those suffering from HIV and AIDS. He was the martyr of the early church era and is known as the West's first gay icon, largely due to the artwork of him following his death. In life, he was noted for his youthful beauty, and in legend, he was, and in legend, he was the desired of the Christian-hating Roman emperor Diocletian. Feelings changed, however, when Sebastian, a closet Christian, publicly protected two Christians from being tortured, resulting in the emperor ordering his death. His unique martyrdom has been forever immoralized in art as depictions of an athletic, loincloth-garbed young man, bondage to a phallic-shaped tree-slash-pillar, and writhing in painful ecstasy with arrows penetrating his supple body. That's gay. That's really gay. This image has captured the interests of queer artists since the Renaissance due to its transgressive mix of spirituality and overt sensuality. The church-approved imagery was so homoerotic that it became a form of safe pornography, wherein Christians on the down low could ogle at it lustfully without their intentions being obvious. Even nowadays, St. Sebastian is often used as a subject of queer art, depicting him as the arch archetyped tortured closet case. In the 1990s, due to his formal patronage of plague victims and informal patronage of gay love, Sebastian was adopted by liberal Catholics as a patron saint to the AIDS movement. In Catholic veneration, his feast day is January 20th. 
that's it, folks. That's the end today. That was a good one. I liked it. On Monday, we're going to be reading about the European magical community um, invoking deities in homoerotic love spells. So that looks pretty exciting. Um, yeah, we got some good stories. Okay, so that'll be Monday's story. Just like light, just like a quick 15, 20 minute read. Um, and then we can go about writing, you know, as one does. Um, okay, folks, that's not the only reading we have today. We also have the emp empowerment deck. This is just a nice little light reading to finish off the day. Figure out what type of forms of self-love we need. Ah! <laughs> I lost you, TikTok. I'm coming to save you, TikTok. I promise. Okay. Oh, hi, friend. Oh, hi. Oh, this is weird. This is weird. Um, can I... Okay, we're just going to do it this way. Hi, friend. I can't see you chatting with me, but we're just going to hang out right now. Um, okay. This is the Empaths Empowerment deck. Um, and Holy Spirit, I invite you in now. Let us know what type of boundaries we need to establish for ourselves this weekend to take back our power, to claim our power back, spool our power back in ourselves so that we don't burn ourselves out. We can take back our country, take back our lives, take back our world. <sighs> and just live the life that I know that you want us to be living. These two? Oh my goodness, there's three here. Okay, that's fine. It's the weekend. We got time. Guys, first and foremost, we're going to take baby steps. We're going to go slowly like the patient turtle. Do not try to rush or force anything. Baby steps are golden. They will lead you to your fondest goals. If we're taking back our power, folks, if we're taking back our country, we can't burn ourselves out on the first day and try to do it all at once. We got to do baby steps every single day. That's how we're going to win. That's how we're going to win by waking up every single day and recognizing what do we need to do today to take our power back and to take our life back. So we, tomorrow we can do it again. That's what we're doing. We're starting with baby steps. And then we're going to experience the passion of fire. Once we get going, folks, we are going to be on fire for our cause. We're going to figure it out. We're going to get it back. We're going to, we're going to change the world together, folks. Re reignite your life by, uh, your life force by gazing into a cozy fire, recharging in the sunlight or lighting a candle, allow fire to spark your vision and vitality, a bonfire. This weekend is a perfect weekend for a bonfire. If you can go to a bonfire, do it. Fire meditate, gaze into the fire. It's very, very fascinating. And finally, folks, we're rounding this off with enjoying the tranquility of water. This is so perfect. What a perfect reading. To remove stress, immerse yourself in a soothing bath, walk near a body of water, or gently splash water on your faith face. Okay, guys, as we're taking baby steps, it's also very, very important to remember balance. We need to stay in balance in order to continue walking our path. We're going to get thrown off balance and we're not going to be able to continue. We need fire and water. We need passion. We need soothing. We're going to do both. It's going to be amazing. We're going to rise up. I love you. Thank you so much for joining me on this reading. If you, uh, I would love to hear, you know, if you, what you enjoyed, if, if you enjoyed anything. Um, we, I did buy the the book for next, next, the next reading. Um, it's supposed to get here on July 13th. And I think I'm scheduled to finish reading this on July 18th. So right at the end, but I'm very excited about it. Um, so that's that. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Um, I love you. You take care and we'll see each other on Monday and, you know, take the power. It's yours. It's your power. You got this. You're going to fight the good fight. I love you. I have faith in you. Take care.